Welcome to the Best of U.S. Investors and the Weekly Platinum Channel Review. Today we're going to go over chart formations with Mark, along with what could be coming in the stock market based on the technicals. And then we're going to get into the 2024 refinancing of debt, along with what opportunities China is going to present to us in the future. So let's get going. Technical indicators have become a dominant part of how markets trade. And so understanding the chart formations that they form can be very advantageous to your wealth creation. In this next section, Mark talks about something that we haven't talked a lot about, and that is spanning out a little bit bigger in the future or in the past and looking at a bigger picture and seeing what kind of patterns are forming. So when we look at the S&P, the Dow, and the NASDAQ, and what formations they're forming on a long-term basis. So let's check it out. Okay, SPY. Here's the S&P 500. You can see this week, you know, even though we're at record highs, you can see, uh, we still are, we've come up and we've gone into another kind of a sideways trading pattern and we can go back. We had a big run up, sideways pattern, run up, sideways pattern, run up, and we're starting to look sideways again. We're right on uh, the intermediate resistance level and then we have some cells right above that. And it's been like that, you know, for a while. And, this, and these levels move as, as your prices move. Uh, I want to show you something else here. Let me go back. Let's go back and just look at a longer term pattern and I don't go into chart. I don't go into chart patterns that much, but there's an interesting pattern here forming, um, and this is called a rising wedge. And you can see this is just the S and P 500. Uh, this is going back to the end of October where we started our rise. The rising wedge is when the highs, uh, you, the highs are getting higher, the lows are getting higher, and you're seeing uh, when you when you chart this out, they come down and they start hitting off that level and then they'll come down and hit but the wedge is 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 diverging and at some point this is going to get so narrow uh that it's going to go one way or the other and the most chartists in this theory will think it's going to go down it's going to come up and break this line so this is one way that, that chart technicians use patterns to to say okay if it, if it goes above this line and contains it then we have a breakout to the upside if it comes down and goes below this we're gonna have a breakout uh, to the lower side uh, and again, these are charts and patterns that everybody's watching. Okay, so uh, I think uh, someone made a comment yesterday that I think someone's watching my charts because TLT went down. Well, they are watching your charts because they're watching the same charts we are, and they're and in more advanced chart patterns are looking at this, saying, "Okay, you know, this is eventually going to probably uh, head south at some point." So you know, just be aware that there are other chart patterns out there besides. And this is a longer term view of, of what we're looking at. Uh, out there, Dow Jones. And again, this is just 30 stocks. This is the ETF. And again, we have a sideways pattern. And then we started breaking out uh, with this week. But again, you know, we're hitting right up here on the intermediate resistance level. And we have cells above it. Uh, I mean, the MACD uh, is pretty much flat. We got a flat embedded uh, stochastic. We got an RSI. I mean, it's just steadily continuing to move up. I think. I think I went and did a chart here. Oh, yeah. So here's the Dow Jones right here. And you can see it's in a uh, rising wedge pattern, too. And we'll see what happens. But normally, a rising wedge with this, with decreasing volume, uh, as a pattern progresses, uh, strengthens the bearish uh, interpretation of this chart. If we go down to the volume, you can see our volume has been going down. So again, tech, uh, technicians are going to look at that, and they're going to say, uh, this is going to be, a, oops, I don't know why that's holding that. This is going to be a downward, uh, at some point, breakout to the downside is what a technician would, would probably tell you at this point. And then we'll go to the queues. Uh, and the queues, you know, although we're seeing very, you know, up and down, this week's been up and down, up and down, right along the intermediate resistance. And here's where some cells are. But again, sideways pattern, we move up. We're getting into kind of another sideways pattern. It's uh, interesting to see. See if I did this one. Yep, the same kind of thing uh, on the queues we're looking for in an upward wedge. Again, 
declining volumes. We had a little bit of a, a peak here, but for the most part, but watch this. This is another pattern you can look at uh, and learn about uh, if you want. And oil, as I said, is is very volatile, you know, energy and energy. Uh, and so you really got to keep us tight while watching on it because a new story can come out and just destroy you. Here in Devon, we had a candle above uh, uh, the nine. I saw it before close. And a lot of times I'll watch the markets before close and see which stocks might have a candle that is going to close above the nine and get in at that point, which is where I would have got here. And we saw it move steadily up uh, until it hit uh, the uh, 20, which was our uh, resistance level or R1 resistance level oil. I like to get in and get out. So we got out that level and it turned out to be a pretty good deal. But again, news came out, you know, that uh, the, in Gaza, they're going to have a peace deal and, and all this and that, and then oil went down. That's what happened yesterday. Uh, so Devon oil, we did okay on, we were up 2.79% or $1.17 a share. Conoco Phillips, again, just about the same thing. We got above <clears throat> right here above the nine and the 200, it popped up, hit our, uh, at the time, the uh, resistance level got out and then it dumped again. TLT, so look at it today. So the jobs report came out uh, and bond yields uh, went up uh, and you can see what happens to price on TLT or any kind of uh, bond uh, portfolio. So it's right now, uh, this is when we put it on the list, uh, 9486. Typically, you know, the 200 is a very staunch level of support or resistance. Um, it's come down it's some in the 20 and the in the 50 are together. We've seen the RSI go down a little bit uh, on the stochastic. We're still up on the MACD. I'm I'm waiting to see uh, if this 200 is going to be breached or if it's going to be held today, later today. Uh, but we're still up on this. Again, I'm taking a little more risk to, to show uh a little more in the channel of things you can do normally i would have probably been out uh up here when it hit uh the cells or i would have had a stop limit down here at the 200 and we would have stopped out today and you know kept our profit but i'm going to see what happens because i want to show you a little bit about if you take risk what it might cost you or what it might gain you so again we're down a little but we're still above uh, our intermediate support level Couple more. I want to let's go look at the big guys. Here's Meta. Okay, Paul. Sorry, I didn't mean to show this to you. <laughs> but you know, Paul made a good. I mean, look what he made. I mean, it was nice and steady earnings. We'll see what happens. You know, to Meta. You know, a lot of people who bought in here, they're gonna they're gonna bought in here. They're gonna take profits and take advantage of that. This gap will fill eventually. Um, Let's look at uh, Amazon. Amazon looks like Meta. You know, it broke through its resistance. Again, it's hard to break through these. I mean, on these emotional trades that you get, yeah, we'll see what happens. You know, we're above the Bollinger Band. You know, the way it looks, it's, it's highly overbought at this point. But with these stocks, there's so much emotion and money tickling into them all the trickling into them all the time. Uh, you just never know. 2024 is going to be the year of debt refinance and possibly the death of a lot of high risk companies who can't pay their bills. In this next section, I go over the chart of the next 20 or so years of what debt has to be refinanced at or what potential yields they will be refinancing debt that is coming due in the first, second, third and fourth quarter of 2024 along with the what it's creating when it comes to the liquidation of China and the liquidation of U.S. Treasuries and the effects that's going to have on our bond market, but also the opportunity that China's downfall is going to create for another major player in manufacturing. So I, I, want, I wanted to show this one graph. <laughs> It's not too exciting, but um, it definitely is a little bit insightful and it'll give you some insight to what we're facing in the coming uh, second quarter of 2024. Um, we're basically looking at $276 billion of investment grade and high yield bonds that will have to be refinanced in uh, the second quarter of 2024. 
That's um, high yield refinance will refinance from an average coupon of 5.8%. Now, to un remember understanding bonds, you the yield, when you uh, issue a bond, you have a, it's basically a, a loan that if I issue, say, carry a bond uh, for $100 and I'm willing to pay him, you know, I have a good credit rating, I'm willing to pay him 3 to 4% to borrow his money. And at the end of the uh, loan or the maturity date, I issue him back that bond at $100, plus he's made um, he's made the interest rate on it. Well, for high yield bonds, and these are companies like, uh, if you remember way back when uh, Sam Walton went to Wall Street and he financed Walmart as a high yield bond or junk bond. And today that average coupon is 5.8%. Now when comes second quarter, it is projected they will have to refinance this debt at 9%. With investment grade, this is good quality uh, companies. So triple B and above. Um, the average coupon right now is 3.77% that that money has been financed at. It will have to be refinanced at an average of 5.75%, which is the highest since third quarter of 2007. So, when I look at this, this is an enormous amount of debt that in the second quarter has to be refinanced. And as you can see, going you know in this chart here, this is the second quarter of this coming year. This year, you're just under, or this quarter, you're just under 200 uh, billion that will be refinanced. The numbers start to go up as you get into, um, into 2025. And as you can see, you get out to 2028. And you're over 500 billion. Now, granted, that's a long ways away, but what this tells me is there's an enormous amount of companies that are probably publicly traded that have issued bonds um, that are high or investment or investment grade companies and below investment grade companies, and they're going to have to refinance this debt at a much bigger rate than they they financed it initially. The other element is. Uh, Carrie has brought this up about commercial real estate and that commercial real estate is about a $3.8 trillion U.S. issue. Presently, it is basically worth about $1.8 trillion. And the commercial real estate bubble that we're all talking about is really just a United States problem. If you go over to like Germany, like Munich or uh, Singapore or some of these other foreign countries, what you'll find is they don't have a commercial real estate issue. They have occupancy rates of 98% or more. Okay. Why did that happen? Well, during COVID, we all went home and we started working from home on a global scale. Outside the United States, when you know the, the restrictions were lifted, Everybody went back to the office, everybody. And so commercial real estate in Europe and in Asia and throughout the world is not having a problem. We in the United States never went back to work. Now, I think Robert pointed out just recently that IBM issued a, you start showing up to work or you leave the company. What, they're, what we're well experiencing here in the United States is a lack of going back to work and working in office space. That has now turned into our commercial real estate problem, which now is creating our regional, small and regional bank crisis that we're, near, we're facing here in the near term. And so when I look at the risk of the world on a global scale, there are two places that I see risk. I see risk in China. I think that's pretty darn obvious. I'll show you what a uh, China looks like when it comes to a if you had bought the China ETF uh, back in December of twenty one. You would. This is the chart. This is the ETF. It's China C H I N A. You would have bought it. Uh, at a close of $141.27 back on the 13th of December of 21. Today, 
it is worth $88.40. China is collapsing. That's a big issue for us in a way because our U.S., they are, have been in the past one of the biggest purchasers of our intermediate to long-term treasuries. And when I look at the potential crisis of the world, I see China and I see the United States. The rest of the world, maybe not so much. But I think as, a, as China crumbles and continues to crumble, and as they unload their U.S. treasuries to put liquidity into their system, we're going to see a our intermediate term to long-term bonds, U.S. bonds, yields will go up, values will go down, and we will be in a situation where our small and regional banks will start to crumble. And this is when, when this start, starts to happen, this is when the Fed will get anxious and possibly lower interest rates, which would be third or fourth quarter of this year. But in the meantime, as Mark pointed out on that Fed funds rate uh, uh, chart, they're always behind. And I think we're in the beginnings of that. So where is the opportunity in all this? The opportunity is probably at the uh, second quarter and third quarter of this year, because stocks will take their biggest beating in that period of time. I, I have wondered and wondered, is this market is going up because the US government is pumping money into it through their backdoor, uh, you know, their dealers, through companies like Goldman Sachs and saying, here, here's a billion, just go buy the seven, just go buy the seven and keep this thing propped up. I really think none of this makes sense to me. And I believe we are at some point, this thing is going to tip over and it will be in that it will be in these areas. But I look at what hap is happening in China and I believe that will spread west. But in the long run, it's China and us, I think, are the most vulnerable when it comes to all this. So take that into account. Watch, you know, watch the tenure. Chances are I would not be surprised if the tenure gets above four and a half here soon. And you start to see selling, especially since uh, China and some of these other countries need liquidity. You know, if we're the biggest holders of you, if they're the biggest holders of U.S. treasuries, that's the first thing to sell. I mean, they they're going to open up Facebook Marketplace and start selling treasuries just so they can they can pump up their their economy. So I think this is really one of those times after watching the Nasdaq do what it did over the last two days. I just it doesn't make much sense. I, Meta is not everything, and I, I yeah. Put up your uh, your um, China ETF, okay, and overlay the ETF INDA. Here we go. So this is a weekly chart of it. India so is where China was in 1984. Yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Apple but the thing is, built, but... Apple yeah. built three plants in India. And Fox, I think it's Foxtron who makes, who assembles <laughs> the phones. Yeah. And Foxtron is manning them. The, ch the challenge is, as Mark always says, it had been great to get into <laughs> India right about here. So yeah. June of 23. Be cautious I, of this. Well, because this is such a spread. Yeah. Um, I would say um this is a this is an ETF you want to buy for your grandchildren. Mm, buy for yourself. <laughs> Just do it at the right time. <laughs> okay. So that here, this will give you a I'll that's look. against. That is India. Yeah. That's a uh, daily. So you can see where it took off right yeah. here back in November, like most of the Actually, thing, most it took things. took off in March of, uh, what's that, 23? Yeah. Yeah. So it's plateaued. Mark would 
I would yeah. assume point out yeah, this right is right uh, sideways. Yeah, moved higher. Um, you know, it's it's something to watch. Is there a better place to buy it? Probably, probably around forty six or so. I think it's something we ought to put on our watch list. Yeah. From a long term perspective, yeah, I think so. But I think once again, they're they're growing because of manufacturing, right? Yeah. Okay. Who consumes manu you know, consumers consume manufacturing. Right. Take that yeah, in account. I, I I would say it's not immune to a correction. Oh no. But um that uh I think points very strongly that, that <laughs> oh wow. Well. Yeah. Uh, so it it's not even at its all time high. Okay. Yeah. So that that was November wow. of twenty one. Wow. Yeah. So if you do the old investment or well, investment news or investment I IBD uh cup and handle. Yeah. Maybe yeah. that maybe that's your cup and handle right there. At at forty five or forty six sixty five, if it holds up, um, but yeah, I mean, I think I think we're we're in the beginnings of of a downturn, and there's great opportunity in it. And I think looking at things like this, India, where is manufacturing I moved to, uh, out of China, uh, where where are those things going to go? It's just a matter of time to get those companies out, you know, out of China and the dependency there. I think it's important to take into account that something wicked is coming our way. We have overextended because of the printing of the U.S. dollars, the TARP programs that we bailing out of the great financial crisis, the mailbox checks of uh, the COVID crisis, and now we're seeing the contraction of money supply in the system. It is important for you to undertake note of chart, uh, chart formations, but also the macroeconomics of our global economy and what is happening. And, to, and the reason for this is so you can identify where the opportunities lie in the future, but most importantly, take care of the potential downside risk that your wealth could endure if you just haphazardly buy and hold your investments. This is our mission at Best of US Investors. And that is to get you to a point where you can manage your money, have a good idea of why you're making changes or doing uh, investment, investing the way you are, instead of just haphazardly just buy and hold for the rest of your life and say, oh yeah, for the last 100 years, the S&P 500 has gone up. The question is, have you been alive for the last 100 years? The answer is no. The question is, are you going to take control of your investment future and your wealth creation and ultimately your legacy, or are you just let it put it in the hands of Wall Street? Join the best of U.S. investors. Get 50% off our platinum channel for the, for the next three months. And of course, it goes back to the original payment. It goes to $30 for the next three months, $60 after three months. But what you're going to get out of that are the tools and the education and the knowledge to create wealth, but most importantly, how to protect it. Get on the bus, join the tribe. We look forward to seeing you next Friday.